Yeah, let's make sure it works everywhere else. Hey guys, welcome to the rundown. Thanks for being here. Hey Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Heck, <laughs> without you, we'd uh, probably have a lot less to talk about. <laughs> All right. So, of course, uh, we don't have to talk to each other. Um, let's kick off in a little different fashion. Uh, before we talk about what we saw last week, uh, have you guys been seen on LinkedIn the last week or two? Hey, guys. Uh, Welcome to the rundown. Thanks for being here. Hey, guess what? Hey, Jeff. Hey. Uh, our LinkedIn feed's working with about a 15 second delay. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you seen on LinkedIn this week, a couple different folks uh, have been posting about having chats with the, what was it, the OpenAI uh, GPT? Yeah, we, well, we, I haven't played with it personally yet, the chat GPT, but I've had some folks in the organization play with it and say that it's, it's pretty crazy, remarkable, the kind of responses <laughs> that they get from it and how accurate those responses are, uh, especially uh, especially asking it specific, particular questions about the Ignition platform. Uh, I thought that was oh, interesting. Oh, really? Some, some, people, some people were asking them questions about like how to do X, Y, and Z and, and can Ignition help with this? And, um, you know, the, the knowledge that it has to be able to answer those questions not only correctly, but like, you know, accurately is kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, going with I, the uh, ignorance is bliss. Oh, there you go. No, I don't believe it's true. I'm not going to go try it. I'm not going to look at it. I'm going to act like it doesn't exist. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I tried it, Alan, so you don't have to. And after after I did the first, you know, 30 seconds of asking it the same thing that every single other human being has asked it for the first 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> I, I started to kind of go down just a, a, a rabbit hole. I, um, so the open AI responds and lets you know that it's not connected to the internet. It's not meant as um, so much a, you know, hey, give me research or tell me about what's going on in this event. It's more uh, trained on books, on magazines, on articles, and a, and a whole lot of other things in its model, but it's not actively connected to the internet. Um, and so I just decided to ask it about the Cuban Missile Crisis and asked it to give me kind of a summary of what happened and then asked it to tell me, hey, if Kennedy had not responded this way, how do you think it might have come out? And the response was incredible. It was well thought out. Well thought out. I don't even know how to talk about it. But then <laughs> I, asked it, I asked it, what would your perspective have been if you were experiencing this as a middle school girl living in Florida? I cannot, I cannot even believe how well crafted the response was, um, and I would have never known I was not speaking or chatting with a human had it actually not been such a good response. Um, yeah, blew my mind. Cuban Missile cool. Crisis. All right, Arlen, I believe yeah. you've got, I believe you've got a Cuban Missile Crisis. We were chatting before we went live. This is the only reason. Oh, yeah. So I still remember my dad at the time was he worked for Grumman. And so he worked on all the Minutemen missile silos. So we lived in Altus, Oklahoma, Cheyenne, Wyoming, Hutchison, Kansas. Um, I think we were in Cheyenne. I was maybe four and a half, five years old. But I still remember uh, my dad getting a phone call on a landline. And he ran out of the house and we didn't see him for 12 days. And that was the Cuban Missile Crisis. So literally they go to the silo, uh, they were locked down. Uh, they had, everything was loaded, the gyros were in. They very rarely fill the, every time you fill the um, missile with fuel, you, liquid oxygen and a reagent, but they had them filled, the locks were off, the keys were in the locks, the generals were, you know, had their finger on the button. So that's how close it was. And uh, it was interesting stories on his version of how people reacted being locked down in the bottom of the silo in that situation. And some of the people you, you would have thought 
would have been really good kind of lost it and then other people kind of came to the forefront but uh yeah it was uh you know over the years i found out that we were a lot closer than a lot of us realized mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my uh my dad served three tours in vietnam and he tells a story where they were in vietnam and they were in a camp out in the jungle and he has uh, night terrors and he will sleepwalk. And he um, he actually, in his underwear, got past the wire in, out into the jungle and then came to what like woke up and then panicked because he realized, I got to get past the guard shack, get back to the wire, get back to my bunk. And he's like, there's no way I'm going to make it back. But then he did, he, he like snuck back in and got back to his bunk and then he couldn't sleep because he realized if he could do it, anyone else could do it. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for humoring me on OpenAI. Try it out, uh, you probably already have, except for you, Alan. Yeah, maybe, right, maybe tomorrow. tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about what last week. I want to kick us off. All right, so Arlen and Travis question. Um, we saw we saw that demo that you guys did last week um, at ICC, right? Um, after you came off stage after ICC or during ICC, did people get it? Did they did they get the potential of what they were seeing and how that's going to impact the their how it's going to impact our capabilities? to get fast ROI and to, and to get uh, usable information back to our operations. I, from my standpoint, I, I think a lot, yes, I, I did have a lot of good reactions. I mean, realize that during COVID, we actually had done the Amazon SiteWise demo the year previous. Right. And, and I think that one is like, mm, I don't know what I just saw and I probably don't care, but uh, I think over the last 12 months, the realization of we've got to get more agile with being able to put these together. And my goal, just like we did in the demo, is if I can't get on a call with a customer and get something real, demonstrable and working in a one hour call, if I can't do that, then it's probably not going to happen. And still today, we have cut, there's so many people that are in analysis paralysis on trying to get started because they think they've got to go off and get a whole team put together and get a department put together and then go do deep learning on all of the tools in the cloud. But those become a commodity once you get your infrastructure up. So you've, you've spent all this time putting it together to something that you can't, it's not repeatable. Mm -hmm. So the thing I like here that we showed is that by using Ignition and all the tools that are right there that, that people know about, we were able to make a simple connection to an MQTT broker and go both to Azure Digital Twin and to AWS SiteWise and do that with very little required knowledge of all of the inner workings of that. And I think that's kind of the epiphany is that if we can do this in a day or two days at a minimal cost and at least get something up there, then customers can start taking that and expanding on it. But we've at least enabled that first level of engagement and we've made it simple and we've made it tools on platforms. Mm -hmm. So I had lunch with a, I had lunch with a friend of mine who's a CIO, and uh, I was I was talking to him about our workshop. Uh, he didn't he didn't watch it. After I gave him an extremely hard time about not watching it, um, we had a conversation about you know, hey, would you come and show my team how this works and how how we can take advantage of it? And we had a discussion about yeah, we can do that. They can just go watch the. The workshop and it will it will do everything it will tell them everything they need to know but i'm welcome to have you pay me also but here's here's my question Arlen, and this is where this is where i think um we as an industry 
like have an issue, right? So the CIO was like, oh, so you're telling me that I can take the templates that my team's already built, they're in ignition, the UDTs are already there, and I can get them right into SiteWise into machine learning. Yes, you can do that. Okay, you need to come show my team that. Well, what's my next question? My next question is, okay, but what problem are you solving? What do you want yeah. to actually do with the data? Because yeah, we can get, and it, it goes back to the conversation we had, I'm gonna say four or five years ago, right? When talking about, okay, yeah, we've got these injectors. Now we can get data up into the cloud. It's, it's OT data, it's not structured, not con contextualized. Well, now we can get contextualized data in a model. Well, we're so much farther along the road than where we were five years ago, but still there seems to be this disconnect with actually solving a problem and driving value from that, that data at the machine learning. Is that, is that a, a discipline of not, not understanding the technology, the algorithms, or not understanding the process? Or maybe it's both. I don't know. I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. Well, I was going to say real quick <laughs> while I was pondering the response to that to your question, and <laughs> that a lot of people that I've talked to after that after ICC, in terms of you know these sessions, and and Carl and I've done a lot of webinars and a lot of, a lot of you know demos and on these on this with various customers, and it tends to go over their head if they don't have that use case. That's that's what I was you know you're, you're pointing out. I think the obvious. Um, because the folks that have had a use case, they attempted it, you know, whether it was themselves or working with the consultant to go and try the spaghetti mess within the cloud to try to move data around, as Arlen talked about. I mean, we've seen customers really struggle with that and spend lots and lots of time and hours on, and have a really brittle system at the end of the day because it's just, it's just so many moving parts, right? But they're trying to, to, to achieve a particular outcome. They have a, something they're trying to solve. And, and they're going to work towards that solution, right? So those, those folks, like, this was like a, a breath of fresh air, right? It's like, oh my gosh, this is going to be so much simpler for me. Um, but I, a lot of people that, that we, you know, sock this to, first of all, have never even considered thinking about the cloud. They don't even know why they would go to the cloud. What are those use cases? So I, I just wanted to, to, uh, to, to give you my, my anecdotal <laughs> there because it's, I, I think that's the fundamental problem here. I really do. Yeah, that, that, Alan, that is the elephant in the room. I mean, it, I, I, I'm the first one to say is that the, the, dem, the capabilities that we've got, that we can build a UDT and we can have it in Azure and SiteWise in a few seconds, that's not even half the problem. Right. Right. It's, it's okay. What do you want to do with it? Now, um, I have a very good friend uh, uh, that I've worked with at Amazon. He's now uh, with Snowflake, uh, and, I, and his name's Poogle. And I like his kind of like outtake on this is that ultimately a lot of this has got to go to unsupervised machine learning because although we can get data scientists behind a particular process and and optimize it for that, we don't have 10 million data scientists to put behind every factory and every machine. So I think it's going to be a combination of what we can do with unsupervised machine learning and it's maturing, you know, to Travis's point five years ago, we were, we were quite happy to get raw measurements into a data lake. Yeah. And then it kind of turned into a data swamp because <laughs> I think everybody realized at that point that we dematerialize our, process variables we put them all in a data lake and now somebody's got to put them back together again so i think the huge step that we demonstrated last week was okay you've got the subject matter expertise and the tribal knowledge at the edge you built the udt you know your processes and that that udt went right into the model and right into the time series database so now we're we're we've done an exponential leap on where you can get started, but it's still what do you, okay. You can get started, but started on what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the catalog, right? It's the catalog of solutions of, hey, I've got a, uh, I've got a very complex P and ID that I want to, I want to put into some learning and just allow it to just 
you know, that unsupervised type of uh, algorithm that's going to just evaluate that that data and the what's happening on the process side. Then you've got alarming. You've got a lot of different things that that people could start using this for, but we we somehow have to help the community like bridge the gap, right? Because now now you've taken you, you've got the vehicle that gets the data to the machine learning now, which is which is phenomenal. That the opportunity we have now to get a UDT that's built in ignition to the cloud in seconds, it's awesome. But now we got to figure out a way to be able to, um, and it may come down to, I'm just trying to think through the community of like the cross collective community that Travis and I were, were a part of and building, right? We were, we were trying to pull together these thought leaders and leaders within the different industries that were like helping these other industries that were just coming into the ignition kind of community on, okay, here's some tools and here's some things that are going to help you. Right. So thinking through how do we, how do we start to develop a catalog of simple solutions that will start to build that catalog into a depth that is much more complex, but you know, we're all doing the same thing. Right. We're all doing process control. We're all doing, we've got a tank and it's got an outlet valve. It's got, it's got an inlet valve. It's got pressure. It's got temperature and we're trying to control it. Right. Um, the, the, the different caveats to that. Yeah. There's differences there, but we're all doing the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think one of the things that we are trying to do is to provide, is to really cultivate that community um and and to provide tools that allow people to do that cross-pollination as you're saying there like not just collectives uh where they can and collectives are great because that's where they're going to go and, and talk about the difficulties they're having right and right. and just do it amongst the peers but at the end of the day if somebody goes out and and accomplishes something they had a use case they built it they they delivered it they were able to to solve a pain point well hopefully they'll be willing to share that with the rest of the community in terms of what they did, what their approach was, what their use case was, as well as to even share what their data model was, right? Because I don't think that these things are secret sauces. It's ultimately the fact that the, the organization taking those steps and they're actually doing doing all these things, it's going to give them the leg up, right? That, that advantage. And, and that was one of the reasons that we in the webinar tried to really highlight the exchange. And we, we put the models up there because we want we want to see more folks do that. I think if I think you can kind of, there, there's no one partner is going to help everybody do these things, right? It's going to be the collective community helping each other and then talking about those. Now, that's something you were very passionate about, Alan. I mean, you really wanted to, 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 to cross-pollinate with other end users and, and different industries to understand their difficulties. Yep. And also to be able to empower those users that are incredibly intelligent and have this, this, kind of a depth that they can offer to the community, but they don't have a voice, right? They, right. they, they don't know Travis Cox. They don't know Arlen. They just are like, I'm just a user, but I'm doing all this amazing stuff. And how do you connect those people into the bigger community, right? Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's illustrate that real quick. And we're going to keep names out of it because I don't know that we have permission to share a name, but we met an end user and Travis, I know that you, you would know him by name but kind of, kind of on his own, trying to bring a distillery into an industry 4.0 solution and just thumping his head against the wall. Like he was a one man army, right? And in that way, he was pigeonholed there, left the distillery and reached out a week ago to me and said, hey, I've got this incredible project. It could bring clean drinking water to thousands of people across Africa. I need help with this. Where do I go? Hey, I know a guy named Alan. Let's get you guys talking because it's T sensor heavy, uh, control heavy. We want some input on it. But this is a guy who, had he not made that change a month ago, would still be, you know, one man, one man against the world. And now all of a sudden he's actually he's made a change and he's he potentially could help bring the solution to thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. Um yeah, it's just that's incredible to me that it's just those small little movements that can have huge, huge reaches. I, I wanted to come back 
to this concept of solving problems. Um, the point of this that we see, I think a lot of times is this still this OT IT separation, right? Like we can show, we can show an IT audience last week's demo and have a very different reaction than showing an OT audience. Most of the OT audience is going to say, I, I don't understand the point of this. This doesn't. Oh, not, not just that. Don't, don't try to take my data and put it in the cloud. <laughs> Maybe, right? Protective still over the data. Yeah, I get it. Mm -hmm. um, I was in a room um, with, I don't know, 15 or 20 um, plant managers for an aggregates company a couple weeks ago. And it was very, you know, the things that they were asking for on the analytics side was very much that just, here's my daily operation. Here's the five KPIs I really need. It was, it was, you know, all production based. Here's the amount of goods we produce. Here's the breakdown of that. Here's our downtime and such. One guy out of that, one guy out of those 15 or 20 plant managers basically said, hey, um, yeah, but can you tell me where I'm going to be at the end of the month based on my run rates? You know, he was thinking differently than everybody else. Now, why? I don't know. But that's the guy that if you can get him to, if you can empower him, he, everybody else looked to him immediately and you could tell he was a leader in the group even though he may not have known it if you help that guy solve that problem now 15 other plants start to do the same thing because they respect him as a leader i think that's the key is we have to identify who those leaders are and make and give them input and wins i think a lot of it too within organizations and and alan you came from more of that background so you can provide some of your experience but a lot of them it's 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 difficult for the education to kind of be uh, be part of the culture of the company, right? Um, where you know you, you want to get into all of these amazing you know modern you know technologies and and leveraging the cloud and and for a lot of people in the OT world it's extremely scary, right? Because what's the most important thing they have to do is keep operations running. I mean, op, you know, what does a one hour of downtime mean? It's millions of dollars, right? In cases, so. They're, they're, of course, they're going to be a little bit protective and and scared because they see these, uh, you know, this as as you know something that could affect their systems, right? And what I know Arlen does a lot of work with in, in in the demos is to show how we have to demonstrate a how we can fundamentally make democratize data, but make operations function better, right? Make the, the SCADA system they have better than it was before, right? And if we can do that, we can earn their trust. We can show them that the, these things, this is possible to do this, not, not only get data in different places, but do it securely and do it in a way where we're not affecting those operations. And I think that's incredibly important, but a company needs to be, that's going to be part of their culture, right? All the leaders across both sides of the fence really have to come together to be able to, to communicate the objectives of the company to show here's the goals we want to get to how can we all what can we do to you know to contribute to those goals how can we work together and do it in a way where we're avoiding things like shadow it i, I think that is super scary right you get some cases where they you know they, on the ot we got to solve a problem and and ultimately just completely ignore because there's barriers or whatever and and they do a thing where they open themselves up and we've seen some cybersecurity issues that have happened right with the different organizations um, so like it, it's this OTIT, that bridge we've had, or the, you know, the rift, if you will, we have trying to get a bridge. I, I think a lot of it's just that culture. And I, uh, I see it quite a bit. Uh, I don't know, Alan, if, if that's something that you try to really cultivate on your end. Well, we, we went through a convergence, the ITOT convergence. And I'm, uh, so let me just break it down to the, what we found to be really the root of the problem, right? So the root of the problem becomes who and it's not who owns the data because the company owns the data right so if you work for company x and you're in ot and you're in charge of hey you have this plant and you got to go put in a control system in this plant and so you're like okay i'm gonna go do that and you're empowered to pick the platform or the platform's already picked for you whatever and then there's a mindset and it's in ot it's a, it's I would say it's a common mindset that the person who's running that project 
they have the the this mindset that they they own the data. They're going to name the data what they want. They're going to they're going to you know des- design the templates and they're going to do all that the way that they see fit. And they're not going to go and find out what the other location that they have no responsibility over how they did it. Right. Here's the example I give of and over again. When I was a technician working, when we had five different locations, global locations, and the same um, it, um, integrator who did work on all five locations, when we said, hey, we've got a new project that we're going to do, do you know what they showed up with? Every time they showed up with a blank piece of paper. And they say, okay, what do you want to do? Right? Instead of showing mm-hmm. up with the standards that, hey, this is what we did over here. This is how we data modeled everything. This is the tag name structure we did. All these different things. They show up with a blank piece of paper. Why? Why does the integrator do that? Well, my experience is the integrator does that because he makes way more money starting from scratch than starting from templates that are already built. I'm not saying that every integrator is in it just to try to get as much money as they can out of it, but I think there's some something to say to that. But ultimately, the integrator is doing what he's been taught because when he shows up with, you know, location X's plans and standards, location B says, we don't care about location X. We're doing it our way. This is this is our plan. Mm-hmm. And they've been empowered to do that. Well, once you've done that, you now kind of locked yourself into this little silo that to extract the data from that silo and combine it with another silo oh my goodness that's where the data swamp comes in because now i've got all kinds of different data names and structures Mm -hmm. and all this different stuff right so you have to it has to come from a uh, standpoint that the company sees the data as a monitor really it's a it's a value to the company to actually be healthier sustainable you know resilient as a company by taking that data and leveraging it for really whether it's going to be analytics, machine learning, whatever it is, but starting from the very beginning, understanding that the data structure, the data naming, all those different things have to be consistent across the entire company. And the data is is you as a plant manager, you as a technician doing it, you're the steward of that data, not the owner. The owner is the company and the whole company needs that data. It's never been that way in OT. OT, we've always seen it as this is ours, it's our plant. We're doing it. We don't want anyone coming in and getting our data. We want like we have to keep the plan up, and the best way to do that is keep everybody out, right? So it's a hard, it's a hard challenge to overcome. But if we're gonna do, if we're even gonna try to do Industry 4.0, unfortunately, it's gonna come down to. It's really going to come down to putting things over top of these silos that are going to be able to extract the information and then correlate it into, you know, normalized UDTs, normalized structures that then can be used. But the, the, the lift to go back and, and solve that, the problem, all these legacy plants, and it's just, you're not going to be able to do it. Well, but yeah. I think to, to a large extent, uh, come on, we're we're unique we're, we're in an industry where we've been doing this for at least 45 years so we've got 45 years of kind of an ingrained approach now remember what we used to do we were taking care of registers from plcs and rtus and that was a full-time job because we didn't have any context we were stitching a booster station together we were stitching a manufacturing plant together i think the notion of what you can do with a platform like Ignition and the notion that you can come up with a UDT, although plant B may have different PLCs than plant A does, but at least to your point, Alan, we can have a conversation that says, look, let's at least come up with a data model for the company that re- that that first makes it a better, faster, more secure, more available operational system, full stop. But now we can decouple and start providing that that to other people in the company that want to use it. Remember, it was I can still remember in the 80s and 90s, you know, we were working with Amico and BP and Chevron. To your point, a project 
was a 500 page specification that said this register is going to go to this screen it's going to be this color and don't change that yeah so let me give some context so when i worked with era um we did an ignition project right we we went from an older platform well it was, it was still a current platform but we went from a different platform to ignition that project across those five different locations took us seven years and here's the here's the bad news about that w the way that we did it was the traditional way right we said okay i've got all of these tags these tags are associated with a register and an hmi now I'm gonna now I'm gonna go to a new HMI and now I'm gonna build new tags and I'm gonna associate those new tags with the register and the PLC. And yep. it wasn't because we started so early in 2013 when we started that, and then the, in the process of we had our standards, we we took a year to just build the standards, our data structure, the UDTs, how we're we gonna name things, how we're we gonna the colors, all those things, right? We defined all that at the beginning to say, hey, we're going to be consistent across the whole company. And then we get into 2014, 2015, MQTT starts to come on stage, 2016, 2017. And by the time we were in 2017 and start actually talking about Sparkplug B and then coming in 2018, it was like, that's the answer for us. Like I, if I could have, instead of doing what we did, you know, actually said, hey, we're going to, we're going to start modeling this thing at the source and then figure out a way to publish that to a broker and now i can plug in any hmi i want right i can plug in ignition i can grab that data i can plug in you know whether it's tatsoft or some other something other hmi that can talk uh, mqtt well now i'm d de, uh, i'm decoupled right uh -huh. got yep. my my data coming in and now i can plug things in and then the, the tags just show up and so I think we're in a much better place now to actually accomplish that. But Arlen, how do we do it? How, do, how does the company, even looking back, if I was to, to still be at, at ERA and we said, okay, we're going to start doing that same project today, like the lift to figure out how I take a PLC5 and a Slick 500 or a Monocon 975 and now I'm going to figure out, OK, I got to get that thing figured, you know, like I'm not going to go back and rewrite the program. So I'm going to have to put something on top of it, suck it into something else like Ignition, model it and then publish it. It's yep. it's complicated, man. This is, uh, we have a tangled web here that is uh, very well, difficult to. Without uh, those without those enablers, um, you know, the UNS. I think we're all describing a UNS in a way, right? It's the question yeah. is how far, how far to the edge does, does the UNS extend? And in Greenfield, yeah. right? In Greenfield, we want it to extend to the edge every single time. Like ideally, we always want it to extend over the entire organization. But if you're doing well, if you're growing, you're acquiring. And if you're acquiring, you're acquiring a mess. Even if it's not a mess, it doesn't match, right? It could be different. It could be working great but it's not going to match what you've established. So you have to ask that question. Do we, do we rip and replace? Do we change out everything? Or do we say, Hey, for these new instant, for these assets, we are going to have a conversion point. And that conversion point might look like ignition where I say, Hey, I don't, I'm not using ignition for SCADA here. There's already SCADA. It's already working. I'm going to use ignition to standardize how I bring data into my model from this point. And, and that's, and that, to that extent, Alan, that's what we're seeing Ignition use for a lot. In other well, that's words, what, yeah. That's what I worked with Vincent on, right? So the whole reason that, that we built that uh, segmentation in the Opto 22 Epic was so that I could take just the Opto 22 Epic processor. That's it. Just the uh, zero base Opto 22 Epic. I could throw that thing into a PLC panel. I can now talk locally on a 192168 network to a or serial to a legacy PLC, bring it into the opto, run ignition on that, and now I can model everything at that local at in that PLC panel, 
drive my my local PL, local panel off of the HDMI and the USB cable off of that Epic, right? So now I'm now I only have to have a touch screen. I'm driving the touch screen off of the Epic and then I'm bringing in all that legacy data, modeling it and then going to a broker from there. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of my that was my okay, if we're going to do this, I got to have some kind of low entry cost that I can throw into a PLC panel that I can extract that legacy data get it modeled in my, my standard templates and then get it up to a broker. And now yeah. I can pull, pull that out of a broker and whatever I want, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you're hitting the head on, the nail on the head in terms of approach, right? Like we we look, we know we live in a brownfield world and, mm-hmm. and the, that world's super complicated, right? I, I deal increasingly with customers who have uh, more than a quarter million data points, if not millions of data points across you know, either site or even across multiple locations. So it, it's a, it's a, it's extremely difficult, you know, task, uh, as you're saying, Arlen, right? To look at that whole elephant, like, okay, how is this going to look in a, in a new architecture, new world? Um, but I think that's obviously, I think for anybody, it's too big, right? It's too big to think about. And if, if you were to go, if, if the business says, hey, we, we want to, uh, we have this, you know, uh, we want to get our, get our data to the cloud and and they and they tell it, everybody let's let's just do that right then then you're going to go in there and be skeptical and be like this is impossible how are we going to be able to do all this right because you know how much work is involved in it but however if the approach is simply like let's start with something simple what is a a, a use case that we know that we have right and energy is typically one i know we'll talk about energy a little bit later too but but energy is one where there's some low-hanging fruit in that Everybody's trying to reduce the energy costs. Um, po- po- possibly, n- they don't really know how energy is being consumed or how their, you know, how their operations are are using that. And so, if you stick with that, it, it's something tangible that the approach is. Well, I'm going to fundamentally look at an architecture where I have edge. I, I connect that data. I convert it. You know, I, I publish it through, uh, you know, to the unified namespace. Something that we've been talking about here. And then ultimately I can get it up to different levels. We, we get there, we solve a challenge, we get some ROI and we get motivation in organization. And motivation, I think it's key, right? Because you, you, you can't motivate like an operations team whose their job is keep operations running and they probably have seven, eight projects already going too at the same time, right? So they're trying to, to work on. But, but if they can see that that impact, what the impact has not only to their team, but to the organization, it drives a lot of future projects. and and it makes a lot of those things possible. But you then come back to, I, I'm architecting it fundamentally the way that's going to allow me in the future, right, to, to solve, to, to do better. And, and if, you know, if, if we were to live in a greenfield where if I was a brand new plant, man, I, I probably would be only buying new devices that were, they're, they're the source of their own data, right? They publish right. it themselves. We wouldn't have this, this conversation, right? Um, because it would be extremely easy to plug it into the cloud and do what we've been talking about here. So, I just want to point that out, like a lot of what what I've been trying to do with customers is is to is to try to identify something simple that we can do uh, that can easily demonstrate success. And because, yeah. you know, a success breeds more success than motivation. People want to be motivated. They just want to they want to feel con- like they're contributing to the overall, too. Right. But it's a it's a culture thing. It's not just something that one person can try to drive alone. No, absolutely. It's a culture thing. It's a culture thing. It's also a, a we live in an environment in that, especially in the OT space, where you don't ever get fired for doing the same thing, right? right? For, for doing the thing that you've been doing for thirty years, you're not gonna you're not gonna get fired for doing that same thing. Um, but you absolutely can get your neck into a you know into a noose if you were to say, hey there's this new thing I think is going to transform our company, this and that. And then you, you go and execute it and you bring down a few plants and have a multi-million dollar outage. That's the problem. Right. And so, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Let me, yeah uh, I, I, go ahead. Sorry. Um, no, you're fine. I want to float just a, a drawing that I've been working on, on my own, um, on how we talk about architectures, right? Because I think we can, we can talk about it, but to put a little bit of a visual to it, um, I don't know if everybody will agree with, with, uh, this or not, but I w- I'd love to get a little bit of feedback. And this is talking about how an analytic framework 
is not the same thing as a UNS and how they actually work together. Um, and so if I just was walking through this document, what, I, what I'm looking at is potentially, of course, all of my devices, all of, all of my, my gateways, getting them aligned and into, the, into a UNS. We want to standardize and we want to standardize for the entire organization whenever and wherever possible. Um, but typically what would happen, typically what happens is out of that UNS, every one of my applications from data link to ERP to MES historian is plugged into that UNS. And then I'm trying to figure out where to do my analytics, right? It's like, do I do the analytics in the historian? Do I send everything to a data lake and do the analytics there? Do I, where do I actually create the measures of what it is? Where do I transform data into information? And so this concept is naming another piece of the solution as an analytic framework, connecting it in real time to the UNS for the real time data flow, but then connecting our historical stores, whether it's relational or time series into that analytic framework and having a bi-directional, bi-directional relationship between the UNS and the analytic framework. Wow. Yeah. I think you have, I think what you're representing here, I think there's some things on the on the left that could be a little bit different, but ultimately what I think you're representing here is this giant gap we have in our industry in that everything on the left going to the unified namespace, going to whether it's Gated and Historian, we we can do that, right? We can we can figure that out. That's typically done through OPC UA or some proprietary, you know, sweet link or whatever it is, right? But tying the operational data to the ERP, the M, you know, not the MES, but analytics and really that that ERP session, section of the business has been this giant chasm that we have a very hard time closing that gap, right? And so I do agree with you that that unified namespace being kind of that pub sub broker that 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 framework can subscribe to and get that data is going to help solve that problem but that's a complicated problem right there that, that that is a that's a very complicated thing to do to start tying because because here's the here's the bottom line right mes erp analytics all those the things really it's erp analytics those aren't typically you know on the business side that's not real-time data that's summarized right? right that's all you know day one stuff and so it, get, it becomes very difficult, right, to figure out the way to, to slice that data, combine it with real-time data, and be able to mingle those things together so they give you good metrics. And I should make it just a note. You'll notice, like, MES is not connected to UNS. I'm, I'm, not, suggesting, I'm not suggesting that MES doesn't get connected to a UNS or ERP to a UNS. I, I get the reasons why you would... You want to consider that this was i was drawing up more for a particular uh, use case but I, and and just you know then someone would say well how's that scale right and this concept of tier, tiering it of course right well tiering can you it. go back can you go back a minute i just like to get arlen and travis's yeah. Yeah, yeah the thoughts on the am i missing the mark here what do you think well, I'll say one thing in, in terms of like, I think we can all agree that a unified namespace is, is critical, right? Like to, to get there and, and we're all trying to make that easier and easier and to get people to think about how, you know, data should flow and how you do the decoupling and how you think about uh, what the namespace should be, what those models are, right? Like how you represent that data. There is a tremendous amount of work involved in that. and. And we can get there, as you're saying, Alan, we can get there, but it's it's still, you know, there's there's a lot, at least there's momentum. There's like, we see that shift industry changing where there's there we see the people can see the reason to do that because the fact that we can then provide data to where it needs to go. Right. And there's so many different consumers of that data these days that that want it, right? Now, the analytic framework, I think what's so important is like typically when we look at analytics or you know looking at historical data and trying to glean insights from it we're typically doing that in a tool that kind of defines it for itself right and I, what i say by that is like let's say it's an, it's an historian and and it does a great job logging that data and then providing some 
analytics and showing that data in ways that people can make, can, can get really good insights out of that. Uh, but that package understands how that data works and, and what that data represents, right? But you need to go to another package, which could be something completely different. Maybe it's something for maintenance management or whatever, and it has to re reinvent that wheel, right? It has to do its, it has to do its, the, 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 understand that data and do things with it there. And so we have these different silos of things that ultimately are, they're, they're providing tremendous value, but they're fundamentally working off of their own version of that, uh, of that data, right? What we get to an analytic framework is really the combination of that unified namespace, right? We have a, there's a recognition that that's, that's there. That's the, sol the source of truth. But then we're storing all of our data into a, I, I want to say an API, like more or less, right? The data is being stored against that, con against that context. And it's in, a, it's in a framework that anybody can tap into. So now all these different packages who want to, to do something unique are not reinventing the wheel in terms of, of understanding the data against historically against what it really is, what that context is. And I think that's the piece that's been missing for so long. And what's so exciting about these digital twin you know, frameworks in the cloud is that they are, they're not saying we're gonna solve all your challenges. We're going to provide to you this framework, this API that everything can kind of tap into and, and it and it opens up your eyes a little bit in terms of the possibilities because now you know everybody can can contribute to it whether it's providing data to it or whether it's consuming data from it but it's it's to the organization it's the framework that they're going to use for them going forward right it's it's um you know a, a way of of centralizing that and and making it uh, and, and really democratizing it so anyway that's my my two cents i see that as a really critical step that that uh, you know the technology today is allowing us to do. Yeah, and I think that you have ignition that's very strong at that control system space and can be used up in that ERP space, I think, and that, we've seen that. But I also think this is where a tool like Flow is gonna be able to, to be effective in modeling what is gonna be able on the enterprise side and then tying in from the Unified namespace and building those models that that correlate both. And now I have a model that I can also through MPTT send right to that MI or the ML learning, right? And site wise, which I think oh. is gonna be, yeah. the, that's the combining of the, of the solutions at the enterprise side, along with, hey, we've got these models that we built on the control system side. Yeah, I think that's so, so important. It's a recognition that there's no one piece, one piece of software or platform that's going to do everything for an organization. And, right. and we recognize that really early on. Mm -hmm. We try to provide tools to integrate, to make things possible. But like, if we could provide data to this framework and others take advantage of that, do amazing things, and then there's other pieces uh, that contribute to that framework, ultimately we benefit from the results and from the Absolutely. data that's there and we can provide a better a better operational tool to an to somebody because there's a, a single pane of glass but we didn't have to be responsible for that entire thing and and that's what excites me because then mm -hmm. customers can really win by putting together the systems and and the architecture that for them is going to provide them the biggest benefit right the um you know, Walker, uh, Walker Reynolds has preached something that I really caught myself on not paying attention to until recently. And it's this concept of stop trying to solve solutions with, with software, or with vendors to solve them with technology. And, it, and so getting that bigger picture, and that's what actually inspired me to start thinking outside of a vendor I represent or a vendor I'm working with or a vendor I favor, how do we, you know, how do we actually solve this problem just on on a technology standpoint. Um, and I do want to thank HiveMQ. Um, HiveMQ, I used one of their drawings as my basis for this, changed, you know, changed a good bit of things, but I do want to acknowledge um, that I've done that since I am sharing this publicly. I wasn't originally going to, wasn't part of this today, but as we were talking about this, uh, the other piece I did want to show too, just, and we'll move on, but how this would potentially scale. This is just my headspace and my thoughts how this can scale from sites to enterprises just in replicating those UNSs and those analytic frameworks and tiering them. And the key here, again, because we're building this based on technology, is that I should be able to plug in multiple vendors or solutions into that architecture. Um, 
So it might be it might be ignition as an analytic framework or ignition as SCADA, or it might be a TAT software, it might be a high VMQ broker, a cherry broker. It shouldn't matter. I should be able to just if I acquire a new asset and I can get it into this format, I should be able to move easily between my uh, information easily between my sites and into my enterprise. And I should have a standard measure of, of that information, meaning I should be able to say, yes, we are making two different products in two different lines or on two different sites, but here's the standard way we talk about production. Here's the standard way we talk about utility utilization or, or raw good consumption. And, and Arlen, I, I, I want to, I know you talk about this a lot, but I, and, and you do a great job with it in terms of, like all the work that you've been doing over the past, you know, is it 40 years now, you said? How, how many? Uh, 45. 45, oh, right? All, all the work that's been going into, to, you know, to looking at MQTT and Sparkplug and all that. My, my point here is, is that is you're, you're, you're trying to create this unified namespace, and these frameworks that are, uh, gonna, I'm going to say platform independent, right? That, that are, you know, where you could, you could build this, but then if, you know, if you're using, some provider, like they say you're going to cloud, cloud provider A, and you want to switch to B, you're not reinventing the wheel down below. And I, I know you speak to that a lot because that's really important. We can't we can't tie this to a, a specific vendor either, right? We've got to keep this, the, the, the need for openness is my point here, right? Right, right. And, and that, I think that's what resonated with the audience when we showed uh, one MQTT connection going to both Azure and SiteWise at the same time. And, and I think that a lot of uh, light bulbs went off at that yeah. moment. But, you know, if, if you look back at to what you all are saying, let's look at let's look at Phillips 66. So 1999, Andy and I did MQTT. Phillips put in an MQTT infrastructure. Now we're what, 23, 24 years along the road. They have a different SCADA system. They have a different historian. They have a different tank management, tank inventory system. They have a different ticket tracking system. But what didn't change is their infrastructure, right? And that lets you, I think we're all saying it, it's the serendipitous nature of data. I should be able to plug something in, try it. If it's yep. great, then let's go. But I can simply unplug it. I haven't, I haven't gone through in the way that we engineered things is we tied, we hard coded a PLC to an application. We hard coded that application There's to another story. application. And now if we want to do anything, we've got to go all the way back and start over. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about what we're doing with MQTT from day one is again, Andy and I called it the serendipitous nature of data because all those projects that you talked about, Alan, you know, you always say, okay, is the, is the functional design spec done? Yeah, it's done. And as soon as we executed that, the operator would go, whoa, I didn't know that. Can you do, can you take this and put it over here? And we go, nope, it wasn't in scope. Hmm, yeah. How frustrating is that? <laughs> you know what the, you know what the most frustrating thing was on that project that we did? Um, the old HMI system would mask bad communication and it would just have the, the numbers go stale. So when we put ignition in over and over again, we had people calling us saying, this is, this system is crap. This is terrible. <laughs> and we're like, can you tell us why? And like, cause I've got red overlays all over my screen. And we're like, Oh yeah, that's because you have bad data. <laughs> it's not, it's not the application that's causing that. It's the fact that you've had that bad data for years and years and I can show it to you. In fact, that the data that is on the screen doesn't even exist in the PLC anymore. It's not there, it hasn't been there for years. So that's that was one of those, those aha moments when we're like, oh yeah, information is definitely powerful, but you get used to the ignorance is bliss, right? Like, hey, my screens are great. Everything's great, everything's going good. You have no no idea of what actually is happening in your system. Yep. Yeah. Lenny uh, Lenny Smith over at Flow tells a story about how they'll do a Flow deployment for a ninety day trial, and uh, and in that deployment they'll get an OT team and that'll be getting a 
you know, a, a, sh a shiftly or a daily or a weekly report, right? And they'll, and they'll have those five or 10 KPIs that they can't live without on that report. It's how they do their shift changeover meetings or it's how they do their end of day meetings or their standups. And he, <laughs> his point is it's funny because you know, you know uh, when the trial runs out and you get the immediate phone call, hey, I need my data. I, I, need, that, mm -hmm. I need that information. I'm, I've got a shift meeting coming up in four hours. How do I get this turned back on? That's when you know you're, you're, you've been effective. And if you don't get yeah. that phone call, then you've done something wrong uh, in your deployment. Yep. Yeah, we saw a lot of ignition that way because because they get the, the two hour trial. <laughs> two hour trial, and, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Just put it out there. Who's, who's idea, do you remember whose idea the two hour? Because that's a bit that's very different thinking. Um, and obviously, the company was founded on different thinking. But who had the idea of the two hour trial? Yeah, I mean, it really is. It, it came from Steve, right? Um, from the you know the founder and the owner. Uh, he came from him saying like. We need people to be able, this needs to be accessible uh, and they need to be able to download it and see it and, and play with it and all of that. And, and the exact two hour, like what that was going to look like the two hour trial period. I mean, we, we kind of stole that idea from another that was, that was doing something like that. And, and uh, because uh, we've been using different you know products out there. And so we thought like, this is the perfect way, like have it where it's, it's accessible every two hours. It's annoying, but ultimately they can keep going and they can keep trying it. And, uh, and that was an important part because like all the, especially all the technology we have today, like, could you imagine like this entire stack that we're talking about and, and saying, here's the amazing, like Arlen and I do these, this demo, here's this amazing stuff you could do. And then the customer tries to go and actually do a POC and they realize, uh oh, I got to spend a hundred K to do a POC to, to get access to it. I mean, that's crazy, right? All the stuff that we could do here, anybody could try it without even buying, paying a dime, right? They can literally, even in the cloud, there's trials in the cloud to get all these different services spun up. And so, uh, you know, technology is more accessible, more approachable. It's uh, really the, the people aspect, man. It's just a matter of, of, of getting that, driving that culture change so that we could actually do this stuff. Well, the two hour trial is ingenious because if it was an eight hour trial, I could just imagine the very first thing on some Yeah, shift change. The first thing you do is shift change. change. Press the reset button on yeah. shift change. It's uh, just yeah. enough, and it's I'm just sure enough. Travis, I'm sure Travis can talk towards the uh, all the different ways people have tried to circumvent that two-hour trial and write code that automatically resets that button. And, <laughs> uh, well, oh, you know, it's it's uh, definitely definitely people have tried. Um, uh, it's been pretty effective, though. I gotta say. <laughs> yeah. Have Have you caught anybody with a servo on a mouse? Uh. No, I, I have not personally seen that or heard a story of that. Um, that uh, would be interesting. However, I have heard of there there are um, uh, web automation platforms, like especially ones that, you know, they do for testing. Like, you know, you could spit up a web yeah, client, I mean, you could test clicking buttons and all of that. Yeah. And uh, we have heard of people doing that, but you have to go through the authentication flow, right? So there's, it, you know, it, it takes them, the amount of time it takes them to spin up this flow, they should be focusing on building a freaking project, right? To solve some <laughs> well, yeah. And then on top of that, you got to pay that guy who's trying to to try to, oh, sure. you know, beat the system, right? So that guy spent a week figuring out how to do it. If you had just taken the money you paid him and bought the license, you'd be, you'd be then, yeah. Yep. But I'm going to go ahead and just, this is a freebie. I think you should do it. I'm just going to say that. ICC 11. I'd like to see a challenge of the most complex Rube, Go what is it? The Rube Goldberg machines, where it's an overly complex thing for a very simple thing, for extending an ignition trial. <laughs> right? Like how- a dangerous <laughs> game. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm in. I, I want to be part of a team that builds one. <laughs> if there's a, uh, I don't have the time. I, I want to be in, but- Hey, yeah, um, we-, we we have talked about like hackathons and things where we can have those kinds of competitions and fun things. I mean, the build on was clearly an attempt for that. Um, but there's, there's some cool ideas out there. We should talk, talk more, Jeff. <laughs> well, we, we have a, a plan. Ultimately uh, it's more my vision than Jeff's, but ultimately my vision has always been that we would have a conference where, you know, we do these little workshops and we're going to do one day kind of a bigger problem. We're going to try to solve. Right. Ultimately, we want to get to a place where we have a conference that's a four-day conference where you 
you literally start the conference with if the boxes sealed on the stage and you're going to have an infrastructure team take those boxes and install them and you're going to build from scratch an entire process with you know with edge io with uh, actual physical equipment that has you know and while that's going on my vision's always been to have another parallel where you have literally a red team trying to attack and get into the system while the other people are doing the, the you know building that system and then have at the end of the day have like you know reports back from each so that you know you have guardrails and you can't you can't disrupt and destroy things but uh, i just think it'd be fascinating to to actually bring people together to see what could we do with this technology that's available to us right i would love to see that because we stop and start in ignition right um and and but seeing the whole everything being put together the whole system and and what goes into that and and the fact that these attacks you know these kind of threats and things are real and and looking at uh yeah uh, that'd be awesome when you think now. about you could literally have that cyber team going and doing social engineering right going over and talking to that guy who's programming and you know watching <laughs> put his password in you know all, there's so many different opportunities so that people start to understand Oh, I didn't even think that somebody would be able to look over my shoulder, get my password, and then take that password and then go do something with it, right? I'm in now. Yes, yeah. yeah. This, it, this, it, it was, vision. I'm in. We just have to fund the thing. And we have to have the audience all say, hey, if we do this, we'll show up and we'll buy a ticket because that's what I buy I, I haven't I haven't bought any lottery tickets ever, but I think I may buy a couple just to see if maybe yet, you know, I can fund it that way. <laughs> Well, I will let you guys know the poll I did last week on the uh, on the virtual workshop. Uh, we had a seventy five percent yes on I would show up for a one or a two day regional. So, I awesome. Yeah, not not an unsure, not a no, but a but a yes or an absolute was at a seventy five percent. The yeah. the pieces of value that the audience said was most important to them was live demos. Um, social networking and hands-on interaction um, slash uh, exposure to new technology. Um, least valuable um, at the very bottom, only got one vote out of I think a hundred or so was um, meeting future talent, rising talent, um, and then second was the actual formal training. It wasn't there wasn't a huge interest in that. So, for what it's worth, um, the audience is behind us. We just would have to figure out how to get all the vendors together and make it happen. And I think this is a good time to plug what's getting ready to happen on January 11th and 18th within a great live. And that is the man. This is a weird. This is my spark plug plug best plug. How's that? <laughs> you did spark great. Plug. There you <laughs> go. Uh, we're going to kind of do that, right? So on the 18th, we'll talk about on the 11th with a, a, a pre-rundown, a, a, a rundown, and uh, yeah, I don't even know what to call that. But we're going to talk about it um, with the working group. We're going to talk about the spec. We're going to talk about what's in the future of the spec. We're going to talk about the the TCK that is now out. Um, and then we're going to actually do a live plug fest on the 18th of January. And that's going to, Alan, in a bit of a way, that's going to demonstrate part of your vision. We're going to have more than a half a dozen. I think it's like nine or ten, maybe it's even a dozen different vendors. And we're going to say go, and systematically, we're going to show we're going to show a, an enterprise architecture. And systematically, we're going to go from vendor to vendor. Each vendor is going to have like eight to ten minutes, and they're going to configure and turn on their application or their device, and data is going to flow. And we're going to step away from this thing after two hours and have a complete enterprise architecture, edge to site, site to enterprise, enterprise to cloud, that is going to be moving data back and forth in, inside of this UNS slash analytic framework. So I'm super excited about that. We just don't have the time to have the red team hack it while we're doing it. That's the only thing. <laughs> Maybe somebody will just take it upon themselves to try to hack it. And uh, hey, I've got a meeting I got to go to, Jeff. But Arlen and Travis, I just personally, you know, I, I can't tell you how grateful I am for the friendship we have and the really um, the impact you've had on my career and uh, personal life. So love mm -hmm. you guys and uh, thank Alan, you for everything Alan. you've done for the community. 
Alan, wrap us with a dad joke, buddy, and then off you go, and we'll close right in behind you. Yeah, in my, my town, we've had uh, we've had this uh, theft going on where people have been stealing all the tires off police cars. They jack them up, to take the tires off them, and the police are actively, tirelessly looking for them. <laughs> That's good. That's good. It reminds me of my childhood. My dad, uh, great memories. My dad used to roll me down the hill inside of the old tires. Yeah, they were they were good years. <laughs> They were good years. Well, yeah. well, well, last night I was, you know, got to think about a dad joke, right? So I was like, well, maybe I'll call my dad to get a dad joke. I said, hey, dad, what would be a good dad joke? And he said, you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 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 I, ouch. Oh, that's, yeah. Oh. yeah I, you know, it sounds like counseling needs to happen next, but. <laughs> It's, uh, right, yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Alan. Appreciate Bye. you as well. All right, All right Thanks, guys. Alan. We'll wrap it up. Arlen, should I give you a chance? Is there is there a joke burning? Well, you like you like music, don't you? I love music. Well, have you have you heard of the, about the new band, uh, Ten Twenty Three Megabyte? <laughs> no. Well, they're pretty good, but they haven't hit a gig yet. <laughs> well done sir well done love it uh hey guys great convo today i appreciate you and uh look, forward, right. look forward to the uh spark plug plug yes fest. And, hey, looking very much forward to that yeah that's happy, gonna be holidays. Cool. happy holidays merry christmas happy new year and uh, we will talk to you in january all right thank you guys Later. thank you so much uh, bye bye